Welcome in everybody to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It is me, Joey P. Joe P. Zapia. With me today is Andrew Erickson and a new member of our team at Fantasy Pros. That's right. I know it's NFL free agency season coming up and I understand there's going to be a lot of player movement, but the same can be said sometimes in the fantasy community. And he wasn't necessarily a free agent, but he was certainly somebody that We've been scouting for a long time. You watch the 40 times. You love what you saw in the bench press specifically. But he has been a, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine for many years uh, from the Fantasy Black Book and some other ventures as well. And he's been a frequent guest here at Fantasy Pros. And I am just absolutely delighted to welcome to our Fantasy Pros family, the king of bros, Derek Brown, Debro himself. Debro, welcome to Fantasy Pros. You are one of our new analysts here. You're going to be on the podcast every week until the end of time, hopefully. And uh, I got to tell you, man, it is great to see your face today on our YouTube channel and to uh, to have you on board with myself and Andrew for the show and for this upcoming season. Guys, I mean, look, like I, 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 you talked about it, Joe. I'm getting my bench press ready. I'm getting combine fit. I'm getting ready for the offseason in Dynasty, man. I am stoked, absolutely stoked to be here at Fantasy Pros, man. I mean, so many good people, so much good analysis, and I'm just happy to be part of the team, man. So uh, we're going to be chopping it up every single week, and uh, I know we got a good show on today. Uh, I mean, nothing but happy, man. I can't stop grinning. So if anybody's watching this on YouTube, you're just going to see me smiling <laughs> ear to ear the entire show, man. That's right. And you got the swoosh, which is on your hoodie, which is pretty much the same size as the smile right now that you're rocking. And uh, Andrew Erickson, you know, this is, you know, we were the tag team last week and now we bring in the third member. It's very, for those uh, wrestling fans back in the uh, 90s, this is like the NWO. Who's the third man? Who could it possibly be? And it's Derek Brown. And uh, now the three of us get to talk football at Fantasy Pros together. And uh, I don't know about you, man, but I, I like the way this is all coming together. Yeah, no, I could not be more excited to have to bring Debro onto the team. You know, Debro is one of the OGs. You know, he knows about, you know, mm -hmm. back in 2017, the fantasy football convention in Dallas, friggin' yes, Texas. Sir. Anyone that remembers that convention, it was like way before, you know, we've we've had the fantasy football expo, which is a, a great um, that's a great event that's put on in recent years. But before that, it was this weird expo that, you know, Tony Rumble actually got in trouble for because he was going to go there. And they were like, you can't do that because of gambling. And now the, uh, I believe the NFL likes is sponsored by Caesar Sportsbook and all that stuff. So it's been, it's been a long time coming. It's been a long time coming since 2017 when I got to meet Debro. I mean, who knows? The, the drinks were flowing. It was a great time. But I'm just happy to have you on board, man. I'm happy, man, because I know I've always uh, respected your work from afar. You know, we've we've uh, obviously met in person. Uh, it, it's going to be a good time, man, because I, I think you're a sharp analyst. And the, I think the three of us are going to have one hell of a good time on this show on a weekly basis. I mean, going back and forth. And I think uh, people are going to get some good takes and uh, just have a good time, man, whether this is a, an escape for some people just out of their day, you know, taking it up 45 minutes, an hour out of your day to listen to us talk about football. I think they're going to get a lot of good uh, analysis and have a good time listening to it. From the sound of it, I'm surprised that either of you remember that 2017 Expo. Uh, but it, it's Barely. Uh, clearly, Barely. I, I, I missed out. I wish I was there. Now, I tolerate both of you. I don't know what like is a strong word. I tolerate both of you at the very least. Uh, but uh, look, guys, uh, seriously, uh, this is a great opportunity here for all of us. I know we're excited to be here, and I hope everyone is excited to listen. So make sure you're following us all on the Twitter machine and make sure that you're uh, subscribing to all of the podcasts. And today... What we've got going on for you is a little look into some early best ball values. And we're specifically using the underdog ADP that what's going on here right now. And I think that there's lots of opportunities that we were even talking before the show about how you see the board early on. If you are somebody who is just a football fanatic, you're sort of already projecting where some rookies might land, where some free agents might land, what the landscape's going to look like and where the opportunity is in ADP. And if you do it right, and take advantage of situations before they really kind of pan out for themselves in reality, 
there's huge money to be made. I myself was just talking about last year. I took huge advantage of the Green Bay Packers situation where everyone was freaking out about Aaron Rodgers. He's never going to go back and play for the Packers. And I said, yeah, 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 right, whatever. And I drafted Aaron Rodgers in the eighth round everywhere. And I drafted Devontae Adams in the fourth round in a couple drafts, which I could not believe. He was still going in the fourth round in some of those drafts. That's just criminal. So that's how you could take advantage of the board and if you have a strong feeling how you know how things are going to pan out it is a great opportunity to like i said take advantage of some of this early adp that's going on here so we're going to each give you five guys that we think are going too late in underdog fantasy football right now on the best ball side of things and of course before we get going here with those names i want to remind everybody we've got a brand new giveaway uh, thanks to our friends at pristineauction.com. We've got a Cam Akers autographed helmet. All you got to do is go over to fantasypros.com slash contest. You just got to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash fantasypros. Screenshot that bad boy. Go over to fantasypros.com slash contest. And just like that, you could be entered to win that Cam Akers autographed helmet through the moon, baby. That's where that Cam Akers stock could potentially go. Who knows? Maybe we'll talk about him today. And speaking of talking... How about our Discord channel? That's right. If you go to fantasypros.com slash chat, you can join our Discord channel at Fantasy Pros for free. But if you are a premium member of Fantasy Pros, you get access to dozens of extra channels, some amazing people there who are great fantasy minds, great fantasy players. Oh, and the three of us are going to be there too, doing things called Stages, which is basically a radio show where you can come up, ask questions about your team. We had people every single week who would come on, talk about the same teams they had. We worked them through all the way through championships. It was an amazing community we created, and I want to double and triple the size of that community this year. And now you get to talk to Derek Brown and Andrew Erickson. I mean, come on. If that's not a draw, I don't know what is. Seriously, I don't know what is. So go to fantasypros.com slash chat and join that Discord conversation today. And let's start with some of these values that we've got on that ADP side of the best ball world. And Derek Brown, since you're the new guy, I'm going to let you go first with the name. I have the first name that's at the top of my list. The guy that stuck out to me when I looked at ADP is Michael Carter. And some people could think it's spicy. I mean, he's sitting at RB23, going at 64 overall. I love that value for Michael Carter. And there's so many things to like here, Joe. Um, I mean, first off, the hop, Tevin Coleman is a pending free agent. So you got Carter competing with what? Ty Johnson and LaMichael P. Ryan for work? And maybe the Jets add a running back in the draft. That's fine. I still think Carter is going to be the lead back guy. And from what we saw in his rookie season... He was fantastic. I mean, all the efficiency metrics are through the roof. He was eighth in yards after contact per attempt of, amongst all running backs with over 100 rushing attempts. And this New York Jets offensive line was quietly fantastic down the stretch. After week nine, they were top five in yards before contact per attempt. I love Carter. I love his upside. And I think that some of the Jets stink and worries about people saying, okay, what if New York drafts a running back? I think Carter still has the talent to be the lead guy. And even if he's in a 60-40 split, 65-35, with whoever they draft, if they draft a guy, I still think he is going to handsomely pay off because no matter how you look at it or you splice it up, his efficiency was awesome, as well as a guy that in, in the games where he played 50% or more snaps, he was a top 24 running back in 62% of his games. So I really think that the sky is the limit for Carter to pay off at this ADP. It's funny, we were just talking about Carter last week on his show, right, Andrew? And it was the conversation of, we all feel like he could be pretty good, and if there's any potential bump in that Jets offense, well, maybe he could be better than good. And in the best ball world, what a great opportunity. 64 overall, 65, somewhere in that range, RB23. That's a pretty good value you're getting for a guy who you're drafting as an RB2 who could even be at the top tier of RB2 by the time all things are considered. Now, again, things would have to break right for that, but at the same time, there's definitely room to grow. Andrew Erickson, who's growing for you in terms of their appeal when it comes to the ADP early best ball and underdog? I'm starting at the, the back of the ADP, you know, down to the dump set, wide receiver 74, 162 <laughs> overall, and it's Cedric Wilson. And, you know, Cedric Wilson was a guy I ended up taking in a recent best ball draft that I did live over on fantasy data and it was weird because I had drafted him and I drafted Gabriel Davis in the same draft and I was kind of looking at the two guys like next next to each other I was like man like 
what's like different about these guys? And I kind of just like compared the two. <laughs> I compared their two statistics next to each other. I was like, oh wow, like they ran almost the exact same amount of routes last year. Oh wow, like they saw almost the exact amount, same of targets last year. Now Davis caught more touchdowns. He had eleven, but Cedric Wilson caught six touchdowns. That was the same as C.D. Lamb. Cedric Wilson was 13th in yards after the catch per reception. Like, working out of the slot, you know, Dak Prescott relied on him a lot, especially in the games where Michael Gallup was injured. And what are we all expecting? Michael Gallup's bye-bye in free agency. Like, he's probably not going to come back. Like, the Dallas Cowboys are up against the salary cap. They can't afford to keep Michael Gallup, but they can probably afford to keep Cedric Wilson. And are they going to keep Dalton Schultz? Like, there's a lot of moving pieces in this offense. You know, trade rumors about Amari Cooper. He's getting cut, so... We're in these early best ball drafts, I'm looking for guys whose values can only go up. And the way I see free agency playing out and this Dallas Cowboys roster shaking out, Cedric Wilson is never going to be cheaper than he is now. Like, people are going to start to catch on and be like, oh, wow, like, Cedric Wilson is, like, the number two wide receiver in a Dak Prescott-led offense. I love drafting wide receivers that are cheap, that are attached to high-powered offenses, especially when they've shown that they can produce high-level numbers. You know, he, his last game that he played, five catches for 62 yards on 10 targets in the wild card round. Like, that's a lot of volume that he's seeing in an offense with a lot of different playmakers in it. So, yes, like, Gabriel Davis is going to cost you a pretty penny. You want <clears throat> discount Gabriel Davis? Introduce you to Cedric Wilson. Love it. Absolutely love it. And he did have some good games towards the end there. And I'll tell you what, too, he's one of my favorite cheap DFS guys to plug in there, too, as a third wide receiver, get a little budget. Uh, relief there too i wonder if that's an early trend that happens too next year we start to look at the dfs boards if wilson's a little undervalued there as well so lots of opportunities for investments in cedric wilson i'm gonna go ahead and make an investment too so you were starting from the bottom i'm gonna go start from the top i'll work my way the opposite way and it's rashad bateman at 88 now he started the season hurt then lamar got hurt and there were a couple flashes there where you saw, you know, Huntley and him lock up a couple times. And it was, okay, Bateman can do this. We we definitely saw the talent in college. We see he's a bigger bodied wide receiver. He certainly fits the role of that alpha wide receiver much better physically than a Hollywood Brown does. Hollywood Brown has his place, but at the same time, even though he had an improved season, I don't think he's that kind of guy that you want to run that offense through. And at the same time, as great as Mark Andrews was, I mean, everybody's got to be looking at this. Like, you have to stop Mark Andrews and take him away if you're going to stop the Baltimore Ravens offense. So when you do that, that certainly means that Rashad Bateman has opportunity. Now it becomes that question, and I know we've debated it on this show. I know Debro doesn't think so. I know Andrew thinks so. I tend to, I tend to agree, in the words of uh, Letter Kenny, is a uh, big Dan, squirrely Dan. I tend to agree with my guy Andrew also that I think Lamar does have another gear in him as a passer. And I think if we see that a little bit closer version of what we saw in college from Lamar Jackson, maybe just maybe we could see Rashad Bateman kind of take that next step. And right now, when you can get him at 88 overall, practically around 100, I think that's a good investment in a wide receiver potentially. And in best ball, I think that's exactly where I think I'd like to have him as well because I think there's some capability there of some big games potentially as the season goes on. And even if even if there's like a small improvement with Lamar Jackson, I still believe that Rashad Bateman can absolutely improve upon what we saw in a rookie season that was more of an incomplete than one that could be graded. I just think there was too much volatility between the quarterback and the injury to really get a good gauge on who Rashad Bateman was. All right, Derek Brown, let's see who you are when it comes to best ball. Who do you want to take advantage of some early ADPs that are low? Oh, all right. Well, I'm staying in Stink City. I'm staying in the Big Apple. I'm staying with uh, another team that people don't want to invest in. And that is going to lead me to Kadarius Tony for the New York Giants. Wide receiver 39. He is in the 80s going right around where Rashad Bateman is at 82 overall. And for Tony, look, I know we saw a, sim a limited sample size in his rookie season. I know the injuries and what have you. And he is not a player that I was high on entering to the NFL, regardless of draft capital and all that kind of stuff. But looking at what he did on a very small sample size, he was fantastic. And I think he could take a huge step forward in year two. If you look uh, amongst all wide receivers – that ran 100 or more routes last year. And this is obviously, I'm alluding to Kadarius Tony's on this list, this tiny list of players that had 29% or higher target per route run and had 2.2 or higher yards per route run. Here's the list, fellas. Cooper okay. Cup, Devontae mm -hmm. Adams, mm -hmm. A.J. Brown, Antonio Brown, and you guessed it, Kadarius Tony. 
And that is a fantastic list to be on. As well as we're talking about, Tony was top 12 in yards per route run versus man coverage. Uh, we're talking about an offense that is going to take a step forward, I think, in pace and passing rate. All this means is it's wheels up for Darius Tony. And if you want to take shots on Kenny Galladay, like, that, that, that's fine. Same ilk, same kind of boat. But I'm going to bet on the talent. And for a player that I think that we could see take another step forward, Kadarius Tony is being drafted possibly, I mean, maybe at his floor right now. So give me the discount. Here's an interesting thing, because Kadarius Tony was the guy that I wanted to empty the tank in free agency because I thought this was a guy last year that could potentially be a league winner. And then unfortunately, the injuries started piling up directly after that breakout performance right actually before the breakout performance is what we talked about let's empty the tank on Kadarius Tony and see if he is that game changer kind of guy and then he was for that one game in Dallas and then after that obviously we know the rest of the story I was trying to give myself some discipline here Derek and you've ruined it because you start talking about Tony and start putting him in the breath of these other guys not that he could possibly be that in terms of productivity at the end of the day because he doesn't have the same quarterback play of a Stafford or or an Aaron Rodgers or some of those guys that those other wide receivers are playing with but is there enough in that Giants offense to take another step forward, in your opinion, with Brian Dable now under that head coaching position, where you do believe that Kadarius Tony can at least improve upon and get the ball in his hands a bit more? Because that's, to me, the big thing. Get the playmakers on your team the ball in their hands is what San Francisco did so well this year, and some other teams are starting to do that. Do you think the Giants will follow suit? So I, I don't want to sound like I'm being hyperbolic in saying this, but we want to find wide receivers that both have talent and can ascend and be a possible alpha in their offense. I think that's in the range of outcomes for Kadarius Tony. Like who's he fighting for targets with Sterling Shepard's coming off a major injury. You have Darius Slayton. You have what Kyle Rudolph and Kenny Galladay. I mean, these are the guys and, and with Saquon out of the backfield. These are the guys well, he's Rudolph fighting for won't targets be there. With. He's going to, he's going to be a cap casualty. I'm sure. And, I mean, I don't and, think, and I don't... there he I mean, literally, like, the, the road is paved for somebody to step up and, and just gobble up targets. So if they're going to be, and I'm not even saying top five in passing grade, top 10, top 10, top 12, that's going to be a massive increase from QB sneaks on third and one or <laughs> second and one from Joe Judge. And now getting somebody, even if we say Dayball might not be, like, an elite play caller, if he's just really good, this is all good good things for <laughs> Kadarius Tony as well as target competition. And if targets are earned, Tony could earn a lot of them in 2022. All right, fair enough. Who's going to earn a spot onto your best ball teams? Andrew Erickson, who's next on your list? Yeah, for me, it is a New England Patriots running back, Damian Harris, RB26, ADP, 78 overall. So if you look at him in to 2020 total, you know, he was first in terms of fantasy points per snap. So super efficient. A lot of it had to do with the touchdown equity that he had in the Patriots backfield. He was second in carries inside the 10-yard line, second to only Jonathan Taylor, fantasy football, RB1. So I'm kind of confused on why he's going outside the top 24 running backs. He is the starting running back for the Patriots. He's PFF's highest grade running back over the past two seasons. He's has one more year on his rookie deal. So if I'm Bill Belichick, I'm like, all right, so I have this like super efficient running back, and he's on his last year of his deal. And I like the guy behind him, but I could just run this guy into the ground and then get rid of him and then make Stevenson, you know, my full-fledged back or whatever. You have James White and Brandon Bolden, both free agents. Like, those guys mm -hmm. have always been the pass catchers of this offense, but I could see a scenario where Bill Belichick opens it up. He's like, you know what? I think Damian Harris is a capable pass catcher. I think Stevenson is a capable pass catcher. And both of these guys get involved in the passing game. And I really think that the Stevenson hype, yeah, I think that he is a really solid player, but Harris is better. I really think that Damian Harris is the better player. I don't see why Stevenson would leap over Damian Harris on the depth chart in an offense where they're going to use both running backs. But I just think that Harris has the grip on the touchdown equity, which is really the point that I want to sell here is if this Patriots offense continues to ascend in Mac Jones' second season, it's going to be Damian Harris that's going to be scoring all the touchdowns and potentially having a larger role in the passing game. Now, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Josh Jacobs last year where, oh, no, he doesn't catch passes. Yeah, well, he didn't catch passes until he caught passes. Like, that was literally <laughs> it. Like, he didn't catch passes until he started throwing him the ball a little bit more. And that's still in Harris's range of outcomes. And even more so with the fact that James White, like I had mentioned, those guys are free agents. You know, White's coming off a major injury. Brandon Bolden is over 32 years old, special teams guy. I don't think they liked putting Bolden in that role last year, but they kind of trusted him. I think Harris 
can really take over a larger workload overall uh, for the Patriots in 2022. And they're not going to get away from the run. They're going to run the football and play defense no matter what. That's what Bill Belichick wants to do. That's what this team is built for. Even if they do add another wide receiver, it's not going to completely change the makeup. All of a sudden, they're going to be this high-flying West Coast offense thing from the 80s where you're just throwing the ball, slinging around where Warren Moon is, and, you know, like get all those, hey, we're Jeffries guys out of the closet. No, no, that's not the Patriots' way. Uh, they're still going to run the football a ton. So I love that call. Big fan of Damian Harris, as you well know already. I'm going to stick with the running back myself here. The 98th player going right now on best ball leagues and ADP over on underdog fantasy. And it's Tony Pollard. And I, I don't get this one. I don't understand why he's not higher up here on the trough. Because if you watched last year and saw what happened to Zeke, and I, I don't understand how you could watch his performance, especially towards the latter part of the year, and not have enormous questions about what this backfield is going to look like. Like Tony Pollard was explosive. To me, the best version of this offense is when Tony Pollard was having good games and he was showing you that explosiveness and he brought a different dynamic to this offense. But I think the best thing for the Dallas Cowboys right now is to continue to put the ball in Tony Pollard's hand. You can still use Zeke around the goal line if you want, but even around the goal line, there were many times where I would see Ezekiel Elliott get the ball, have a defensive back to beat, on single coverage out there and all of a sudden the defensive back would tackle him that is not the ezekiel elliott that we grew up watching in our youth that is not the same guy so for me when i'm looking at tony pollard right now i'm seeing him at almost you know the hundredth player taken off the board if zeke should suffer an injury if zeke really does take another step backwards in uh in the ever evoluting i would say we're at a point now with zeke where so much tread on the tires another year older and Basically, at this point in the NFL, you are, as a running back, an expiration date for the most part. There's like Adrian Peterson and then there's everybody else. Like there's just certain guys that are even going to push that three-year threshold and Zeke has pushed that now into the sixth, right? But at a certain point, you're going to see that decline. And we saw it last year and it's something I tried to warn people about the potential of. And I think they get way too caught up in the fact, well, he still finished, you know, towards the top of RB. That's because RB was an absolute mash unit and all the guys at the top got hurt again. That's the only reason he finished as high as he did. He would have finished at the bottom of RB1 at best had everybody stayed healthy. So for me, Tony Pollard is that guy that I just want uh, everywhere on all my best ball teams because the potential is certainly an RB1 if everything breaks right, but at the very least, a very successful RB2. All right. Derek Brown, give me the next guy on your list who you think is going to be a very good value in some of these early best ball drafts. The guy that sticks out to me, Joe, and that's that. Look, I, I I know that I'm building a stink team. I know that I'm going with all these players that nobody wants and nobody wants to talk about. Like whether it's production or whether it's the team itself. The next guy that j- jumps out to me is Miles Sanders. He's going off at RB 35, 102 overall, and. Legit, this is almost in line with his production last year. He was RB41 in fantasy points per game for a guy that got 163 touches and scored zero, nada, no touchdowns. So legit, everything he did was based off a yardage for a team that down the stretch, and I know that people didn't want to play Miles Sanders and they're still leery of him because he was in and out of the lineup, nagging injuries, what have you. But when he was on the field... He was super productive as far as efficiency. I mean, he's 15th in yards per touch, 5th in breakaway run rate. And for a guy that – look at Philly's backfield for next year. Boston Scott's a restricted free agent. Maybe they don't bring him back. Jordan Howard is an unrestricted free agent. We know that the Eagles are still going to field an above average, if not top 10 offensive line for run blocking. Miles Sanders is eventually going to score touchdowns again. For a guy that I think the talent is there, the opportunity is there, and if we look at him as the lead back, which the Eagles showed us down the stretch, that's who they're willing to trust. Miles Sanders is a guy I'm going to get exposure to right now because I think his ADP, the closer we get up to the season, is also going to creep up. Does this change for you if the Eagles draft a running back here, let's say in the second or third round? I mean, it'll change the the dynamic, obviously. I I don't see them going that route, but it's possible. I mean, obviously, if that's the case, I still think there's meat on the bone for where he's being drafted, though, Joe. Like, RB35, and he's going at 102 overall. Like, it's kind of already baked into his cost that he's going to be a flex play. If he outperforms that at all, then we're still going to be able to garner value from that. 
All right, Andrew, what about your thoughts on Miles Sanders? Because I'm somebody that's off of him. I'm intrigued because Derek is now on him, and he does bring up a good case for the volume at least, but how do you see Sanders being used in this Eagles offense in 2022, and do you think it'll be used enough to even return that RB35, 102 overall value? I haven't really been super high on Miles Sanders myself, so I kind of agree with where I where you have some hesitancy because of, you know, the lack of commitment that he's kind of seen, especially with this new coaching staff last year. But I mean, the price point is ridiculous. Like he's going outside that 100 picks. It's, fair. It, it, it's like, he's still the starting running back. And if you look at what they did when he came back from his injury, where we we're kind of concerned, like, Oh, like Jordan Howard looks pretty good. Boston Scott looks pretty good. Like, how is he going to fall into this rotation? It's like, he came back and was the starting running back. Like he was the guy who got the majority of carries over his last five games. He averaged 15 touches per game. Kenneth Gainwell averaged six touches per game. And I don't know if like people are just hyping up Gainwell, like it's Gainwell season. Like, here we go. Like he's going to be the guy <laughs> when we saw him get multiple chances to be the guy last year, and then they just gave it to Boston Scott or Jordan Howard. Like he was better when he actually played with Miles Sanders as the pass catcher. Now I, I don't think Sanders has like that pass catching ceiling, which again is why he is kind of ranked and going where he's being drafted just because he hasn't really shown the consistency. He hasn't shown the hands. They've always kind of preferred to use a different running back as a receiver. And they don't really throw the ball to the running backs a lot anyway, because of Jalen Hurts is just his knack of, of trying to scramble with the football. But I think the touchdowns thing is so spot on because this is what you look for. Who, who had, who had a lot of drops last year? You know, who had really bad yards per carry? Like all these metrics that regress are the things you want to attach yourself to. He had was efficient and he didn't score any touchdowns. It was like all Boston Scott and Jordan Howard and Jalen Hurts, mm. like anyone else except Miles Sanders. Like that is not something that's sustainable, especially if Miles Sanders continues to be efficient, which he has always been in his career. Like he's always been a guy who's rushed for five yards per carry because he's an explosive running back. And that's something that's going to be coveted in an offense that likes to run the football. So I think that Miles Sanders is, is a screaming value here. And honestly, I think that it's the best value overall of all the players we talk about outside the hundred picks just doesn't add up for a starting running back. In a run-heavy you know offense. What? And in best ball, too, I think it's more appealing. I, I think the mm -hmm. range of outcomes, potentially, when you're just in your regular old, you know, season-long NFL leagues, it's a little bit dicier to have a guy who might not score some touchdowns at the running back position. That's a that's a problem, especially when they get that guy who's on the waiver wire who ends up scoring the touchdowns for that same team or worse on someone else's team that ends up pilfering away those touchdowns as we saw last year with the Eagles backfield. That happened to a lot of people who had Sanders. So uh, I think best ball might indeed be the best place for Miles Sanders. Andrew Erickson, give me another name on your board that you're intrigued with the early value you're getting in best ball drafts. Yeah, so this is a another running back that we're still not really sure, you know, what his role is going to be. We don't even know what team he's going to necessarily be on. That's Chase Edmonds. So he's RB39, and he's at overall 124 ADP. And again, I'm just kind of trying to find these spots in these best ball drafts where I, I identify a player that, can I see this guy's value going up? Like, I mean, how do we see Edmonds' value going down if he just, like, doesn't sign with any team? Like, I guess that would be a reason his value would dissipate. But if he goes to a different place other than Arizona – I have to imagine that the team that he goes to envisions him, okay, like Edmonds can be our pass catching back. At worst, he's going to be catching passes out of the backfield because that's really what his role has been over his career at with the Arizona Cardinals. But when he has gotten opportunities to start, he's been really explosive. When James Conner got hurt during the la during the end of last season, week 16 through 17, Conner, 24 expected fantasy points per game. He has the ability to be a top tier running back when he's given the opportunity to do so. And, there's no guarantee. Like, who's going to command more money on the open market? James Conner or Chase Edmonds? Like, what if Chase, Chase Edmonds is the starting running back for the Cardinals? Like, that is well within his range of outcomes and does not necessarily is reflected in that ADP of RB39. He's going later than he was last year in drafts, and we thought that he could be, like, the starting running back, and that's still definitely in the range of things that can happen in 2022. So I think Edmonds is just, he's just too cheap right now. Well, I think I understand why he's going so late. It's the combination of what you saw Connor do and the fact that he missed significant time. Where do you stand on Chase Edmonds, Derek, when you're looking at uh, his potential outcomes? I, I, I like where he's going in drafts. I think that's one of the <clears throat> the more appealing things about Chase Edmonds because at RB39, you're taking him in the 10th round. Going with Chase Edmonds at that spot of the draft, especially if you're building, and we're talking about different builds for best ball rosters, uh, these running backs we're talking about in this RB30, like flex range and in the, the hundreds, 
if you're leaning into wide receivers early and how you're building your teams, or you're going, say, hero RB, you're going to go draft one guy early, and then you're kind of layering the RB2 position for, I'm going to get a spike week here, I'm going to spike week there, I'm going to get a spike week there from these other guys that are being drafted outside those first like eight, nine rounds. It allows you to build different rosters, and I like Chase Edmonds, especially if you're approaching it that way, because if he falls back into Arizona, if they re-sign him and he's the lead back, I mean, automatically we've seen in, in a part-time role, he could be a top 24 running back. If he gets like the lion's share of the carries, he gets 65%. He is going to be a smash value considering all of this. Yeah, uh, I certainly think when you're looking at trying to find at least talent at the running back position, Edmonds showed you some flashes. In fact, last year was the first time in some of those games that I actually watched him play and I thought, yeah, maybe it could be a starting running back in the NFL. I had never thought that previously watching him, but last year I actually got that vibe. Of course, then he had injuries right after that. So unfortunately, everything I liked last year all of a sudden went to crap. Kadarius Tony, Chase Edmonds, just <laughs> run away from anything that I like in 2022, folks. I'm telling you right now. I don't know what was going on, but every time I started to go, yeah, I like the way this is shaping up. Let's invest in it. And he's hurt. That was a terrible situation last year. I'm going to go with another guy for me. This guy's going at 99 right now overall. And I think it's always fun in best ball leagues to take a few quarterbacks and see what pans out. And I'm going to take Justin Fields. Uh, I know four of the last five games that he played in, he did finish as a QB1. He also had 361 rushing yards over his final seven games. And I'm not one to extrapolate. That's a very dangerous game to play. I like to avoid it. However, I think that if you can ballpark him for somewhere around, what, 600, 650 in terms of rushing yards... Just that alone is going to put him in that conversation potentially as a QB1. And I'm telling you right now, I think it's worth investing in because maybe it is just all Matt Nagy's fault. Maybe things were really worse than everybody could have imagined there. And just getting rid of Matt Nagy and a fresh voice and a fresh start here is good for Justin Fields. We all know how crazy athletic the kid was. We all watched him show up in big games in college at Ohio State. So for me, it's not a question of the talent. It's not a question of, you know, can this guy perform? I think he can, but I don't think anybody can form uh, can perform at the end of the day without good preparation. And to me, the Bears were not a team that reeked of good preparation when they would go out there. Game plans were never good. They look confused at oftentimes in offense. I think Justin Fields in year two, a little bit more confidence goes a long way and hopefully he can improve. And if he does, Justin Fields could be a tremendous value at the quarterback position, I think, in best ball drafts. All right, let's go back to you, Derek Brown, for another guy on your list in terms of value for early best ball drafts. I'm going to go with a guy that's free. He's free right <laughs> now in best ball drafts, going at tight end 23, 183 overall. And that's my dude, Dan Arnold. Um, we want to target, if you're not paying up, you want to go with the late tight ends. And what do you want from that tight end? You want athleticism. You want pass catching upside. How is he going to be using the offense? And that screams Dan Arnold. For a guy that has a 98th percentile burst score, 93 percentile agility scores, if he's on the field, he's going to be catching passes. He's going to be running routes. And we saw this last year. Uh, weeks 5 through 11, 62% or more snaps in each game. He was ninth in targets amongst all tight ends, had a 1.61 yards per route run, which is not like through the roof, but it's really good. And a guy that when he was on the field, we're talking about if you believe that targets are earned, which you should, you really should. He was seventh in targets per snap. And with Peterson, and, and some of this is – I'm not going to say that the, the, these coaching narratives and how they use players, it, it gets noisy. But if we want to look how Peterson has used the position, final two seasons of Philly, they were top two in target share to the tight end in both years. And I think that there is some validity in looking at that usage moving forward in the sense of look at this depth chart, fellas. Look at this freaking depth chart. You got DJ Chark is gone. Laquan Treadwell is gone. Tavon Austin is gone. Those last two names are not sexy names. I understand that. But now he's competing with targets for with Marvin Jones, LaVisca Chenault. Uh, you look at the rest of the guys on the depth chart, ugh, they're terrible. I was going to say, so, I'm still waiting for a sexy name somewhere. Exactly. Jamal Agnew. Jamal Agnew. That's I mean, there you go. Look, I love Swagnew, okay? We're going to go down that, <laughs> that role. But I, I, I like Swagnew. But my whole thing is to say is that if we believe that targets are earned – Dan Arnold has shown us he already can do that. And much less, 
now versus this depth chart, even if they address the position, he's going to be competing with those guys and a rookie pass catcher. Dan Arnold could easily walk into top 10, top 12 production. We talk about also a guy that did not score touchdowns last year. The needle is pointing up for Dan Arnold and his usage in this offense. I love this. Uh, Dan Arnold was a guy that actually last year, Andrew, I remember how many times on the waiver wire show, right? And how many times, you know, on the start sit, we're like, hey, how about Dan Arnold? This is your you know, streaming tight end of the week, right? Because it was there. And and as Derek was alluding to, they're going to use the tight end because their wide receiver options aren't that great. So I guess the question is, with Doug Peterson coming in, his history of using tight ends in the Philadelphia days, do you believe that there could be really even more upside than we imagined for a guy like Arnold? I mean, I think that his ultimate upside will be determined by just how good does this Jaguars offense, how good is it? You know, how... Sure. How much does Trevor Lawrence develop in his second season? I don't season? think it's going to be great. I think we can already kind of say it's not going to be great. I don't think elite is in its future. But can it be middle of the pack, I guess? Is that something that's attainable for them? Yeah, and I think that you're getting Dan Arnold kind of at, again, like a floor price where, you know, Debro mentioned that, you know, the lack of touchdowns was there. If he does score more touchdowns, which is a result of the offense just going from terrible to average, like that's going to give him a major boost in terms of tight end rankings and he's free. And the biggest thing too, and I'll talk about this with one of my tight ends is the usage is there. Like when you get past the top tier guys, it's like, all right, I'm just looking for guys that are like fast, can get open, like command targets and are on the field. Like there are so many tight ends that are in these muddled committees where they just can't score. Like they can't find points because they're just not playing enough. And that wasn't the case with Dan Arnold. So the only concern with him is, oh, did this Jacksonville bring in another tight end? Do they draft you know, a mm -hmm. tie, do they draft Trey McBride? Like that's the one thing that, you know, would put caution towards Dan Arnold. But again, there is no risk with where you're getting him in drafts now. All right, Andrew, why don't you pick things up again with the next name on your board for early ADP values and best ball. Yep. So it's another tight end. So Tyler Higby, tight end 16 overall, 140 ADP. So Higby was kind of up and down for most of the season. He was a player that identified in terms of routes, run participation. Like he was always on the field, like seventh overall in route participation. Now he kind of fell into the, you know, CJ Uzoma type of tight end where he was running a lot of routes and doesn't necessarily commanding a high amount of targets just because of all the other receivers on the respective team. But things started to heat up. A little bit later down the year, he and Odell Beckham Jr. started to kind of be more of productive. So last six games, six, nine, six, four, six targets for Tyler Higby, at least 40 yards in all those contests before his injury. Now, I'm not sure if the injury is kind of playing into a part here. He had a sprained MCL. It didn't He seemed like he had a chance to play in the Super Bowl. Maybe that was never going to be the case. But I don't think this is an injury that's going to overlap into the 2022 season. So 19% target share over the last four weeks. Odo Beckham Jr. is definitely not going to be ready for the start of the season. So whether he's back or not, that's not really a factor in here. Robert Woods will factor in coming back. But I'm looking for tight ends that play in high-powered offenses that have touchdown equity and that are on the field on every snap. And that's Tyler Higby in the Rams offense. So tight end 16, I just think, is a little bit later than I think he should be going. I really think he should probably be ranked closer to that back end tight end 1, tight end 11, tight end 12. But tight end 16, I like the value there. You say the word participation, and I felt like Tyra Higley B gets a, basically a big participation trophy because that's all he was <laughs> last year. I mean, he barely was it six times he finished as a tight end one. And I understand, like, from a productivity standpoint, it's got to drive you nuts, right? As an analyst, you're looking at this and you're looking at the data and saying, he should have more activity. He should be more productive. He's on the field, he's running routes, but they're just not looking his way. And I want to buy in, but I kind of, this is, you know, the other end here. I was struggling with the Miles Sanders one. Now I'm struggling with the Tyler Higby one. So, Debro, what are your thoughts here on Tyler Higby? Because it's great to be on the field, but at the end of the day, Uzoma gave at least a couple of games where he was winning me a week, basically. Like he was, he was tight end one overall a few times, or he was nothing at all. I don't know. I kind of struggle with the Tyler Higby one, too, because when Woods comes back, or if it is OBJ or some combination of these guys... I don't see where the targets are going to go his way again. I'm not massively into Tyler Higby, and I don't want to feel like we're piling on Andrew here with the Higby come on, call. Come on, guys, we come on, guys. I tried to pile on. Come on, guys. I tried to pile on you at Miles Sanders. I gave him the opportunity, and he went your way. So you know, you don't have to be a good guy here. This, this it's all heels on this podcast, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the thing about Higby is, yes, he's going to be out there running routes. My my struggle is also Higby's ability to earn targets 
What I will say in, in Higby's bucket is that, and, and we, we were talking about all these different guys, and, and with best balls, you're varying your portfolio as well as if you're stacking, which you should be in best ball. I think the, the most appealing thing for Higby with me is that if you're building Ram stacks, he's a cheap way to double stack Stafford. He's an easy way if you're going to be double stacking Stafford and you you want to get different and you want to go pay up for Cooper Cup, you want to go Stafford and you want to get a second piece, maybe a third piece, and you're going all in on the Rams to be a top five scoring offense. The Higby appeal, that's where it comes down to me for am I going to draft him? Am I going to prioritize him? No, I'm not going to prioritize him in best ball drafts, but do I think he's a guy that if you're stacking Rams or you're looking at another guy that – even if you're layering bye weeks in best ball, I think that that's where I'll probably get my Tyler Higby exposure. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. And Andrew's completely right, by the way. But it was the same mm-hmm. thought process I feel like everybody had going into last year, which is, hey, Tyler Higby could be that guy that jumps into that tight end one conversation, you know, and maybe elevates and he's a free tight end at the end of drafts. But it just didn't happen. And yet all the opportunity was there for him. And I just wonder at a certain point, when do we... When do we step back from the data and recognize maybe that's just not the way things are going to go? Just because the opportunity is there doesn't mean he's going to cash in on it. I hope he does, especially for Andrew, because he's going to invest in him. So I want him to make some money and do <laughs> Tyler well this Higby, year. Tyler Higby tight end one season. Come on. <laughs> to, be a, to be a tight end one would be something just a tight end one more than six times that would be because it wasn't like being a tight end one was all that hard most weeks no. it wasn't like the bar was set super high especially because kyle pitts had one touchdown all year anyway uh, speaking of tight ends how about one for my end here we go everyone's got a tight end that they like i like cole Komet. and i'm gonna continue to just die on this hill and maybe i will we'll see this year so in year two he basically doubled his productivity. That's what I want to see. I want to see a guy who's making progress. Now, the problem is, it was all in that Matt Nagy offense, which was, well, it's crap. I mean, let's be honest, that's what it was. So the problem here is red zone targets have to go up. If if he can increase the red zone targets, he had zero touchdowns. So we're going to go back to the whole zero, none, nada, no touchdowns for this guy too. If you are a young quarterback, you want to have a tight end that you can look to in the red zone. And I feel like Cole Komet could be that guy I keep going back to the game plans. I keep going back to the play calling, and it was just terrible. I mean, Cole Komet, when you watch him at Notre Dame, was a a mismatch nightmare. He was a guy that could absolutely just run past linebackers, and nobody would want to guard him when they got into that secondary area. So I don't understand why they aren't utilizing the talent that they have in Komet, and I'm hopeful that this new regime is going to recognize that talent and start to use him appropriately. I don't think Allen Robinson is coming back into this fold. I really don't. That leaves you with Darnell Mooney, and a bunch of question marks, basically, and Cole Komet. So there's opportunity. He went, look, he had 93 targets last year. It's a pretty good number here for a tight end. If we can get him into the 115 range, 120 range, and give him, you know, five touchdowns even, that's a guy that I think at 132 overall that I can certainly invest in. So uh, maybe a little bit riskier than some of the other guys we just talked about. But if I'm going to take risk at tight end, I'm going to go all the way for the risk. And I think Cole Komet has shown you, look, he can improve. He can be this guy, third year in the league, I'm going to start to invest in him in best ball. Again, it's a perfect opportunity to do that. All right, let's go to the next guy on your board. The last one on the list for you already. My goodness, time flies when you're having fun. Debro, who is it? Before I give this name, I got to sit here and say, Joe, I love the Cole Komet call. I absolutely I feel like love there's a that call. Coming. Is no, no, there butt is coming? no okay. butt coming. <laughs> no, no butt coming. No butt coming. I'm going to actually just double down on your take. Like, the fact okay. that he is so cheap and he was top 14 in red zone targets and only him and Kyle Pitts were the only ones that scored less than two touchdowns last year. So mm-hmm. I love this call. And if you're layering and you're building cheap best ball stacks, everybody's going to sit here and pay up for Darnell Mooney. Cole Komet is a fantastic pairing with Justin Fields. Um, and I'm going to close you know, out you know my is, guys. Derek? Hold on, Derek, before you, before you give me your last name, <laughs> I think I know what it is. It's, it's because I know you so well. And I, and I always know you're a sarcastic guy, but the Southern draw gives me that whole Ricky Bobby feel when you're like, I love that call, Joe Pizzapia, with all due respect. And I mean this with all due respect, you are dumber than a post. Like, I'm just waiting for like, <laughs> I was always waiting for that back end to happen. So I'm going to have to get over that. But thank you. I, I appreciate your support. Andrew, do you have any feelings on Cole Komet? I just want to 
give you the floor well, I, too. Well, I mean, the the exodus of the the Red Zone Reaper himself, Jimmy Graham. I mean, that oh, is exactly God. the route that he needs. The worst. That's the the route that he needs to get those Red Zone targets. So Jimmy Graham, like that was his only role. Like he would literally just go out there and run routes in the Red Zone, and that was it. And he'd be like, "Oh, a tight end for a bear. Oh, that's Jimmy Graham." Me- pissed me off so much last year when that would go it's like you never saw jimmy graham the whole game it was like oh there he is oh and great there he is not doing anything why can't cole commit at least try and i thought that was going to break the trend because two years ago you saw cole commit start to eat into that a little bit at the end of uh, was it 2020 right you started to see that happen a little bit and i thought okay the trend's going the right direction nope nope right back to jimmy graham terrible horrible idea all right Derek brown thank you very much for supporting me i, I needed that <laughs> I needed that, especially at the end of this show, at the end of this week, I needed that. All right, give me another guy, your last guy on the list that you got your eye on. So I'm picking one name out of the list here, but this is really an overarching theme in the sense that if you're going to go with rookies, right now is the time to draft them, especially in best balls, because you're going to see ADPs for these guys that you're probably not going to see the rest of the draft season. So right now is the time to get in on a lot of these rookies and even if you haven't done your homework, look at the guys that we're, we're looking at probably projecting really good draft capital, which means early opportunity. And the guy that sticks out for me, and but again, we could parse through all these other different names for rookies, Drake London at wide receiver 44, 92 overall. I love him because if you're looking at current EDP, so expected draft position based off of mocks that are collated and stuff like that, He is going to go in the first round. I think we all kind of project that. Now, where he falls in the first round of the NFL draft is up for debate. But for a guy that amongst all collegiate wide receivers, 50 or more targets, fifth in yards per route run as a primary outside weapon last year and sixth in missed tackles forced, the talent is there. I think the early opportunity is going to be there for Drake London. But really, this is overarching. It's like right now, if you're doing best ball drafts, go after rookies. And you could pick any one of these names, like, I mean, really out of a hat. The only guy that's getting a lot of buzz right now that's being drafted amongst the top 36 wide receivers is Traylon Burks. Besides him, you can go with London. You can go with Garrett Wilson, uh, Chris Olave, and and Jahan Dotson. Um, Olave and Dotson are two names that they're not getting as much love in current best ball drafts, but they're projected for top, like, first-round draft capital And if you're going to go with these guys and these rookies, follow the draft capital and pick out whoever your guy is, whether you want value or you're going to go with your guy and be overweight on him. Either way or approach is fine. But Drake London is the name that I want to sit here and point out. Yeah. And what is your approach with the rookies too, typically speaking in best ball, Debra, while we're talking about them? Really, it's, it's who are the rookies that are going to get drafted inside the top two rounds of the NFL draft. And I'm going to, whether it's projected landing spots, I'm going to try to pick out some of these guys that are not getting as much hype and that could see their ADPs creep up. So really a lot of it's it's Drake London because Burks is getting tons of hype and he is getting right. drafted ex- extremely high. And that's fine. I'll get exposure to him. But you look at London, you look at Olave, and you look at Dotson. They all have projected first round draft capital but they're going much later in these drafts so really it's it's look at the guys that project to go top two rounds in the nfl draft and layer your exposures with them uh, at the running back and wide receiver position and tight ends uh for rookie tight ends unless you're just a freak like kyle pitts you can miss me with that i'm just i'm not going to go with those guys unless it's like they're free and they're outside the top 170 or 180. Andrew, what about you? Are you somebody that takes the shot on some of these rookies before they get the landing spots just to get that earlier value before the buzz starts? Yeah, I think that Debro hit the nail on the head where you're just looking for the guys that, okay, who's going in the first round? And you're going to see, okay, so Traylon Burks is projected to be, you know, a first round wide receiver. So why is he going three rounds ahead of this other rookie wide receiver that's also projected to go in the first round when that guy could actually get drafted first? You know, a lot of these Mm -hmm. teams are, you know, it's pick your flavor. You know, which receiver do you like more? Which receiver, you know, fits your system systematically better? You know, that's why I think that you get some advantage to just, okay, like Burks is is great, but he may not be the first guy drafted. You know, why is he so far ahead of a Garrett Wilson or a Chris Olave? You know, these guys, especially when the testing numbers come out and, you know, this Ohio State wide receiver runs a 4-3. It's like, oh my God, like you got to get this guy. Because it's just going to increase. You know, the rookie hype just gets builds and builds and builds. It's kind of the same thing, like, in a dynasty context. Like, what is most valuable right now, veterans or rookie picks? 
rookie picks. Like, because everyone is like way overhyping the rookies. And then a lot of times they don't necessarily deliver on that same amount of value because it's just going to go up. So I think that it makes a lot of sense to get in on, the, get in on them now. Um, and then just kind of like, all right, I got the value when uh, they were cheap. All right, fair enough. Andrew Erickson, who's the last guy on your board in terms of that early ADP value in best ball? Yep, for me. So my last guy, wide receiver 46 going outside the 100 overall players. And it's Juju Smith-Schuster, a, a free agent for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Look, the, the buzzy team that he was connected to last year was the Kansas City Chiefs, and the Chiefs still have a major need at wide receiver. Like they, That was one of the biggest problems that they had on their offense last year was no one really stepped up behind Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey. And where do we see Juju Smith-Schuster thrive the most? When he was alongside Antonio Brown, when he was operating out of the slot, when there were other weapons on the team, when he was in a good offense with a good quarterback. Like, that's Kansas City for Juju. So it's not necessarily like, oh, he's going to go to the Chiefs, but – that's something that let's connect the dots here. Like you got to do a little bit detective work with, with these early best ball drafts. If you try to project, cause if I'm right about Juju going to the chiefs, Oh my God. Like I got him at wide receiver 46 all through March, all through Fe like that's a great value to have there. And with Juju, you know, something I'm taking into consideration more with a lot of these receivers who, you know, have kind of fallen to the wayside a little bit. You know, he has that elite season on his resume, sophomore year. 1400 receiving yards he's only 25 years old still like he's still super young um you know that was something i missed about with cooper cup where cooper cup had a top five fantasy receiver fantasy season on his resume like that matters because when you put juju smith sister's talent with a quarterback in a good offense you can get these types of results where he's going over a thousand yards receiving he's catching seven eight touchdowns so i think smith schuster is a guy that's only going to go up uh, as we get closer to the season what do you think about uh, Juju Smith-Schuster here, D-Bro? Do you think uh landing spot could be the Chiefs somewhere else? And if so, if he does land, let's say, on the Chiefs, does all of a sudden this ADP just skyrocket? Yeah, I think it's a good call by Andrew. I think that if you're – and right now, prior to free agency and stuff, I think the other thing that you can do, because if you hit on it in these early best ball drafts, it's Yahtzee, dude. Like, you're going to be able to build, like, <laughs> different stacks and – and projecting, and, and, and not to say that, like, you're going to take swings and there's going to be lots of misses. But, like, with Andrew talking, like, if he goes to Kansas City, his ADP is going to, that noise you just heard was Juju Smith-Schuster's ADP going to the moon. <laughs> like, that's what could happen. So, I think it's really interesting on all of these free agents, and we, we project, like, he came back at the end of the season, he's going to be healthy, like, walking into this offseason and being able to get a full offseason of work, and if you're building a portfolio for best ball, I like Juju, especially if you're projecting or you're building different best ball stacks. So you want to go the Kansas City route. That's fine. You want to look at other teams where they either have the cap and they have the money to spend and getting different with some of your best ball stacks. I, I like Juju where he's going one. I think he's a good value. And, and when Andrew talked about early career production is absolutely spot on. But also, if we're getting wild and you're going to build not only at this ADP, but unique best ball stacks, because we approach these best balls like large field GPPs. So it's like, mm -hmm. what best ball stacks can I get right now that are going to be different from the field? And you might be one of, you know, tw 10, 20 teams, whatever, that has Patty Mahomes, Juju, where he's going at this ADP. And other parts or pieces that you're going to have to pay up for Kansas City, it's a, it's a good call and it's a, it's a good guy to be drafting, especially right now. Yeah, I would absolutely agree too. Uh, very cheap, good opportunity early on because it's only going to probably grow because expectations always grow. Whenever a guy is in a new place, it's a fresh start. Everything is roses and sometimes it works out and sometimes it's Kenny Galladay. Uh, let's talk about the last one here, or the guy on my list. He's at 155. I dug pretty deep for this one. But to me, I, I want him, and he's free. It's K.J. Osborne. Um, K.J. Osborne got five targets last year, saved one game. He had double-digit fantasy points and half-point PPR. So all he had to do was basically get this guy the ball five times or more, and the dude was money. And Adam Thielen's going to be 32 years old. Adam Thielen missed a bunch of weeks last year. Adam Thielen has a lot of turn on the tires. He was a smaller wide receiver, and I, and I have great respect for Adam Thielen. And now I feel like I'm the guy. Do I, with all due respect, Adam Thielen, and I mean it with all due respect. Uh, <laughs> I am staying away from you this year because I think that when I watched KJ Osborne come out of the gate last year in those first two games, it was very eye opening. I don't think any fantasy analyst that I knew that I heard of one time all off season 
and pre-draft was talking about KJ Osborne. And then KJ Osborne kind of burst on the scene. Wow, this guy's really pretty good. And then went away. We saw the Adam Thielen show for a while. As soon as Thielen got hurt again, we saw Osborne get opportunities. I think there's only room to grow for this guy. And I think considering how cheap we're getting him right now, 155 overall, I mean, come on. I mean, how many guys can step in and be a wide receiver too on a team that historically speaking, has been able to provide more than one good fantasy wide receiver. And we've seen this. We saw it with Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen. We saw it with Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson. This offense absolutely can, whether it's got a new head coach, new OC or not, can sustain two very good fantasy wide receivers on it, especially in best ball, because sometimes it won't be the same guys the same week. But I think Osborne might be able to have some weeks. What do you guys think about Osborne? Andrew, what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, so I think that the thing that's what I want to watch what the Vikings do is do they retain Tyler Conklin and do they try to run? Cause you have Kevin O'Connell coming over from the Rams where we've seen a Rams offense operate with like the two tight end sets between um, mm-hmm. Gerald Everett and Tyler Higgins. We've also seen them do oh, just three, like 11 personnel, three wide receivers. So in the 11 personnel route, okay. KJ Osborne's on the field operating from the slot on every single play alongside Thielen and alongside Justin Jefferson. So like, that's the great outcome for him. Whereas if they do bring back Tyler Conklin, they have Irv Smith Jr. coming back from his injury. Are they running more 12 personnel now as their base offense as opposed to 11 personnel? And then we don't see KJ Osborne on the field as much. So I think it's going to be kind of maybe a little bit of a tell on how they handle the tight end room in Minnesota would be something I'd be just kind of keep my eye on. Derek, do you think that regardless of what formations they like to run, that the Thielen health could open up more doors for KJ Osborne in 2022 anyway. Yeah, I like Osborne and I like the call. Um, one, it's where he's going. And if you're looking at Minnesota, if they repeat uh, what they did last year and their top 12 in passing rates and pace, I think that he is the cheapest part of that offense, which we're saying top five, top 10 in scoring, I don't think is, is being crazy. They're going to be a good offense. I like Andrew's point, too. Um, I I actually would project Minnesota to run a ton of 11 personnel. And this is not just an O'Connell thing, but they don't have to re-sign Tyler Conklin. They could even draft a guy later. Um, They can go with just a run-blocking guy and let Irv Smith do the pass-catching duties. But I think you're going to see a lot of uh, 11 personnel out of Minnesota next year, um, regardless. So I I, I like the Osborne call. And he's a guy that honestly – Yes, he played a ton in the slot last year. He also played a lot outside, like good yards per route run versus man coverage. He was actually, if you look at his route metrics, uh, when he was asked asked to go deep and stuff like that, very, very efficient. So I think that people could peg him as a slot-only guy as well, but I do think that he has ability, what he showed in a very limited sample last year, to not only play on the outside as well, but play on the outside and get open and command targets. Well, we're going to be running a lot of three personnel here on the show with Derek Brown and Andrew Erickson and myself for the foreseeable future. I can tell you that. Uh, gentlemen, it is an absolute pleasure to be here with the two of you. Who says dreams don't come true? And uh, I think we're in for a fantastic season ahead of us. I can't wait to talk draft with you guys. I know we got some phenomenal guests lined up in the weeks ahead. And of course, before you know it, we're going to be in the thick of things come summertime talking about all the mock draft episodes and all the draft prep and rankings and things of that nature. So Derek Brown, once again, welcome to the family. You're like old news by now, Erickson. You're like <laughs> so not the hot new thing. You are so last week in terms of like guys who come to the show and are like like important and a big thing. But all joking aside, it is great to have both of you here. I am super excited. And I'm sure that our Fantasy Pros fan base is going to be super excited as well. In the meantime, if you want to interact with these two guys and and maybe me as well, make sure you join our Discord at fantasypros.com slash chat. That's the place to go ahead and do that. Again, it's free to join. So just get in there and poke around, see what it's all about. And then come football season, I'm telling you, man, crazy stuff. We got baseball going on there right now. We got betting stuff. So anything you're into right now in terms of fantasy, in terms of wagering, Our Discord channel is live, and it is happening, man. It's good stuff over there, and hopefully baseball soon. Uh, Also, don't forget that Cam Akers helmet can be yours. Autographed by Cam Akers himself. He had some downtime in the injury, so he was autographing a bunch of helmets when he was hurt. So at fantasypros.com slash contest, you can go and enter to win, and all you have to do 
is make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And when you subscribe to YouTube channel Fantasy Pros, click that notifications bell because it makes all of us oh so happy. So that'll do it for us. But the story of the game goes on for Derek Brown and Andrew Erickson. I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.